Born out of the flames of the great successor wars after the death of Alexander the Great, the Kingdom of Pergamon was a rump state from the Kingdom of Thrace, and it grew to be an important regional power with a very powerful economy and a very diverse coinage. Today, let's go over a quick historical tour of the Athalid Kingdom of Pergamon through its coins. Let's go! And before starting out, I would like to give a huge shout out to the Kalevala collection, whose owner kindly filmed me these coins. The owner preferred to stay anonymous, but you know who you are, so thank you very much for showing us these beauties. The great city of Pergamon, whose very impressive ruins are a mandatory stop for any history lovers visiting Turkey, precedes the kingdom with its name by many centuries. Its defensible elevated position is said to have been settled as far back as the 8th century BC, but for a little numismatic tour we're heading to the 3rd century BC. By this time, the city was part of the kingdom of Thrace, ruled by Lysimachus, one of Alexander's lieutenants. Lysimachus left Pergamon and the surrounding regions under one of his own lieutenants' control, Philetairus. So well trusted he must have been with him, Lysimachus also left his entire treasury of 9,000 talents of silver, that's around 235 tons of silver. But seeing the rising tensions between his sovereign and the power of the Seleucid Empire to the east, Philetairus decided to betray his lord, defecting to the Seleucid side, which resulted on Lysimachus' defeat and battle and death. Philetairus established himself as a vassal of the Seleucids, but for all intents and purposes he ruled as an independent king, expanding his influence to the entirety of western Anatolia, quickly becoming a local power. Different from the other Hellenistic kingdoms, which suffered constantly with internal power struggles, the Adelaide kings of Pergamon enjoyed a sense of family union and fealty, which allowed the kingdom to remain, remain stable for centuries and the region to greatly prosper all out of this political unity. So how about we kick things off with the first coin of the day, a tetadrachma of the man Philetairus himself. The kingdom of Pergamon had a lot of different mints, they had a lot of very important cities, but obviously the city of Pergamon was the most important one, which is what we have here. This piece is attributed to between the years 282 and 263 BC, by the time Pergamon was a client state of the Seleucids. On the obverse, to make good relations with their new sovereigns, we have the bust of Seleucus I. Although Seleucus was likely already dead by the time this coin was minted, replaced by his son Antiochus, the design of the original monarch was actually just kept. We can see him very well sculpted, looking to the right, wearing the royal diadem, with those wild flocks of hair that are so typical of the Seleucid monarchs. The high relief in these early coins is remarkable. The bust is as thick as the base flan itself. Looking at the reverse, interestingly we have a design that is reminiscent reminiscent to the coins of Lysimachus, the previous sovereign of Pergamon. We have Athena seated on her throne, holding her shield and having her spear resting by her shoulder. The legends make reference to the ruler of Pergamon, Philetairo, or coin from Philetairos. This is a lovely example of a coin design that sort of like plays on both fields, making references to Lysimachus, as people must have been used to seeing his coinage, his designs on the coins, while also making allusions to their new rulers, the Seleucids. After Philetairos came Eumenes, his adoptive son. With Eumenes came Pergamon's freedom from the Seleucids and its establishment as a local power. They quickly subjugated the surrounding region under their rule, defeated, defeated the Seleucids after they, they openly declared their independence, and quickly established themselves as a fully-fledged Hellenistic kingdom in their own right. Pergamon would become a center of culture and learning, with a vast temple complex and a massive library that would only be surpassed by the Great Library of Alexandria itself. So, for this tetadrachma, we have another example that is dated between 263 and 241 BC. On the obverse, we will have a very common image for early Pergamene coins. Philetairus himself, 
Elmenes could have picked himself to be shown at the coinage, but he decided instead to honor his adoptive father. Remarkable, realistic depiction of Philetairos, with his very jowly portrait looking right. Also with the royal diadem, symbolizing he established a fully independent kingdom. I'm gonna put an image of a marble bust of Philetairos on the screen so you can appreciate the quality of the portrait compared to the bust. All details are there. Philetairos was an eunuch as he suffered an accident when he was young that rendered him infertile. It's interesting to see how a typical feature of eunuchs, which is the bloating of the neck and just a normal weight gain from the hormonal changes, accurate, is accurately depicted both on the busts and on the coin itself. Heading to the reverse, we have a bit more of the same. The image of Athena seated, holding her shield, with the Phile Tyro legends. Dating these coins can be complicated, as the early Atelid rulers all just issued coins in Phile Tyro's name. But Pergamon would do a bit of an innovation and establish a new monetary system on the region. The name of the de denomination is the same, it is also considered a tetadrachma, but the weight will be different. With these being slightly lighter at around 13 grams compared to the 17 of the typical tetadrachma. So, these are the cystophoric or kistophoric tetadrachma, and they will be struck all the way into the conquest by the Romans. This is one of the earlier issues, with the type being struck between 166 and 160 BC. Other important cities in the area will also strike the denomination. It will, they will have a complex network of mints, actually, but this one is still attributed to Pergamon. Heading to the obverse, we see the design that gives the denomination its name. What we have here is the Sista Mystica. That's why it's called Sistophoric. It means Sista-shaped. The Sista was a basket used in religious ceremonies where sacred snakes would be kept. One of the gods venerated in Pergamon was Asclepius, the god of medicine. He used a staff with a serpent entwined on it, symbolizing the mysteries involved in the ways of curing, healing a person. The Asclepeions, an ancient version of a hospital and recovery clinic, would have quote-unquote pet snakes kept in them, as they were said to bring good luck and hasten the cure of people sick. Around the basket, we also see an ivy wreath. Heading to the reverse, we have more serpents. This time we have two very complex looking snakes, very intricate. This must have taken quite some time to engrave. They are tightly entwined around a decorated bow case. We can even see the little bow poking from the top. Around the design, we also see a series of monograms which were used to control the issue of coinage each year. The Pergamon would choose well their allies, siding with the Romans as they advanced to conquer Greece. The design of the Sistophoros would evolve as the political events developed, because in the 1st century BC, after doing a little bit of a mistake and revolting against the Romans, as you can see they were all throughout their history, they tried being fiercely independent. Well, but unfortunately they revolt against the Romans, a terrible mistake in their part, and they would fall out of grace and finally be fully annexed and lose any kind of independence they once enjoyed, being incorporated as the Roman province of Asia and having magistrates designated from Rome to rule the region instead of having their own leaders and kings. So our next coin illustrates one of such cases. This is a piece from another city in the region, Trales, minted between 55 and 53 BC. On the obverse, we have once again the Sista Mystica. The design was well established by over a century now, so it was not on Rome's interest to change it and cause mistrust in local commerce. Around the basket, once again, we have the typical ivy wreath. On the reverse, however, remarkable changes. The first thing that calls our attention are some Latin legends. Remember, this was a Greek-speaking region, so this makes a clear statement of power over the locals. We can read Claudius Pulcher, Proconsul. The position of Proconsul was that established by the Romans 
well, actually by the Roman Senate to the local governors and magistrates sent to the provinces to oversee the region. Apart from the inscriptions, we once again can see the serpents entwined around the bow case with mint marks around the design. In this case, a lovely hand holding an olive branch to the right. So moving forward for our next coin, we have a really interesting twist in style. Let's go to the year 49 BC. We are at the middle of the first Roman civil war of the late Republic, and the province of Asia is now on the hands of Metellus Scipio, one of the main generals of the Pompeian faction. Trying to extract as many funds as possible for the war effort, he exploits the province as thoroughly as he can, and of course to impose his authority in times of war. He will change the design of the coin greatly, giving it a very Roman visual compared to what we had previously. For this coin, I'm going to start with the reverse, which is by far the most interesting part. Out goes the bow and the quiver. Instead, we have a Roman aquila, the military standard carried by the legions with an eagle at the top, symbolizing Jupiter. Around it, we still have the two snakes wrapping around the standard like on previous Kistofori, and the legends now show a typical Roman style. Not only they are written in Latin, but they are placed on circular borders in a more Roman style. We can read Quintus Metellus Pius Scipio Imperator. Notice the Imperator, which meant general, leader of troops, to reinforce he was in control of the region and of the local forces. Now going to the obverse, we don't have a lot of changes. We once again have the ivy wreath with the basket with, the ser with a serpent coming out of it. Metellus would be decisively defeated by Caesar's troops and commit suicide instead of having to face the shame of being captured. And finally, we leave the Republican period behind and enter the Roman Empire. During the Imperial period, Augustus reformed the entire Roman monetary system, but still allowed, allowed the provinces with intense economic activity, such as this one, to issue silver and bronze coins to allow trade to flow efficiently. So the region of the old kingdom of Pergamon, now for a long time the province of Asia, was allowed to keep minting the Kistophorus, but it would have its silver content and imagery completely restructured to be in line with the imperial system and the denarius. For each Kistophorus, you could get three denarii, this way both systems were packed together. This piece we have here is attributed to the reign of Augustus, the first emperor. It was minted between 25 and 20 BC, and is attributed to the city of Ephesus, another major city close to Pergamon. On the obverse, total innovation. Off goes the Sista Mystica in the ivy wreath, and in comes the bold bust of Augustus, bareheaded with some very simple legends. Imperator Caesar. I love how simple but efficient the coinage of Augustus is on passing the imperial propaganda. On the reverse, we have the Capricorn, the astrological sign Augustus was associated with. A lot of coins from him in all metals show the Capricorn. Around the creature, the sea creature, we have a laurel wreath. And once again, in some very simple legends, Augustus, leaving no doubt about who was in charge. If we wanted to fully explore the coinage of Pergamon, <laughs> God forbid the bronze coinages of the city, we would stay here for hours and hours. But for now, this will have to do a 300-year tour of the silver coinage of this incredible region. Any history lover would con should consider visiting this place at least once. Once again, thank you very much to the Kalevala Collection for letting me show this, these coins today. So how about you? Have you got a coin for Pergamon you like? Let us know in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a like and consider subscribing if you did. Happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.